Rom says Nog can learn a lot from Chief O'Brien. Captain Sisko bribes Garrick with a larger space to hem dresses. And asking a Ferengi to play a Cardassian game is like asking a Klingon to chew with his mouth closed. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Hust. Today, we are doing a review of Deep Space Nine's Season 5, or almost a Season 6, Episode 24, entitled Empok Nor. We are joined by very special guest, Melissa Longo, because it is a Nog episode, if you can believe that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a good one. By the way, a uh, story by Brian Fuller, teleplay by Hans Beimler, uh, directed by Michael Vehar. I wanted to look at who directed this one. That was really, really interesting to me. This was uh, May 19th, 1997. But yeah, this was the second and final episode uh, that has a story by credit with Brian Fuller. Really interesting crew. How are oh. you guys doing? All right. How are you doing? Yeah, doing good. Um, <laughs> it's funny because you we just mentioned Mike Behar, and you know I just wanted to give him a shout out. He's a good guy. Yeah. Uh, really liked around the set. A lot of people uh, had a good connection with him. And his son, Mike, Mikey, was also uh, working with us in the camera department. So that was another um, cool thing that the father and son type of combination. No way. Hi. So, yeah. yeah, I was really interested to ask you about Michael Vehar because after watching this episode, I didn't see who directed it. But I remember thinking like, OK, I need to find out who directed this because I'm wondering if they're like, okay, this is like a total, basically this is a Deep Space Nine horror story, right? Yes. So yeah. I was thinking, did they seek out Mr. Vehar? Did they say, who would be a good director for this? Michael Vehar can do it. Or did Michael Vehar go, please, I want this episode. I would love it. I mean, <laughs> do you know, Sirach, if like they would specifically pick out certain directors or if michael did a lot of horror stuff in the past that made him the right candidate for this job i guess i could have looked that up um i know that mike had um directed other episodes in the past mm -hmm. so he was he was a recurring director and the other thing that i know is that there was a short list of directors that they pulled from. So they didn't really just kind of go shopping for new directors every episode. It was right. it's a pretty standard list of the, the people that they knew and trusted and maybe recommendations from some of the uh, actors that they also knew. Because I think uh, Avery mentions uh, sometimes bringing in certain directors that he had worked with in the past to come direct DS9 episodes. Um, and actually, when I did this show called The Hoop Life right after Deep Space Nine that was in Toronto, um, I requested for Avery to direct one of those episodes. And oh, so no he way. was put on. The, yeah, so he was put on the slate for the directing of the new the upcoming directors. So, hmm. um, yeah, it was pretty cool that I was able to, you know, get him on there. And we spent that time together in Toronto while working on another show. But. That's a side note, but it, but essentially lets you know how the directors are sometimes mm -hmm. slated, right? It comes either by a high recommendation from somebody in the cast, or it is somebody that the writers and producers are already comfortable with. And I think Vehar has um, kind of established his comfort zone with the producers of this show. So, you know, obviously his son working on this set with us every day added an extra element of familiarity because, you know, he was part of the crew. Interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, so I, I was looking it up and uh, this was the second episode he directed for Deep Space Nine out of seven. So he's got five more on the way. But the one before this, his first one was The Darkness and the Light, which we just reviewed, which also had a horror element. That's when Kira goes back to have her revenge. And then the guy with the messed up, Cardassian with the messed up face captures her and she's pregnant um and so another interesting note that is brian fuller's other story by credit so oh, wow. i don't know if that's a coincidence or may, that, that maybe brian fuller wrote two kind of horror-ish episodes 
And then Mike mm-hmm. Behar just happens to be more of a horror type guy for them. Or if maybe Michael Vehar and Brian Fuller knew each other in some way or something, but I don't know, but either way that kind of paved the way for him to uh, direct five more deep space nine episodes, as well as 13 right. Voyager episodes, 11 oh, wow. enterprise episodes, uh, a ton of Babylon five before that. Um, mm. Anyway, lots of good stuff. Boy, this guy is really established. You're right. It's rock. I mean, this guy, whoo. MacGyver? Okay, this guy's a winner. (laughs) (laughs) And you you can see the kind of old school uh, television um, camera work that in this episode, like, you know, when the bad guy's in the background and they're like walking and there were certain shots there that I would say, oh, this looks like MacGyver or A-Team or or, just the list goes on of the, the kind of things that their standardized uh, television when you see the back, you know, the bad guy and the lighting and all of this stuff. Um, so, yeah, like I said, Vehar was on the list of directors to use frequently. This is the beginning of his journey on the list. Um, I do think it's uh, there's something to the fact that Brian Fuller is working on both of these episodes. So there must be some connection there. He must have, you know, be aware of his work and satisfied with his ability to pull off his work. So, I think there's definitely some familiarity between them. And yes, I also think that it's good that we talked about um, this being a Star Trek horror mm-hmm. because yeah. this is the month, this is the month of October. We're about to, you know, approach <laughs> right. Perfect. And Deep like, Space Perfect Nine did this for us 24 years ago. The <laughs> foreshadowing, the foresight they had, boy. It's perfect timing. Yeah. It is perfect timing. What sweeties <laughs> to hook us up with that. <laughs> now this... Uh, this was obviously a bottle episode and Deep Space Nine is so good at giving us a bottle episode that is aimed at saving money before the season finale, but that it's not like an obvious bottle episode when you're watching it. You're not going like, oh, this is just, you know, person A and person B talking inside a holodeck or whatever. It's like a big, exciting you know, cool, heart pounding episode. And then you go, well, hang on a second. It was really three main characters and it was the regular set just, you know, obviously, you know, touched up and redone and relit and all that. Oh, was- really? I thought they built a whole new set for M. Puck North. No, <laughs> just kidding. They actually filmed it on location. <laughs> oh, even better. <laughs> I thought they were trying to save money. <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, yeah. you know, that's the, the, what really did it was, you know, the music, the lighting, mm-hmm. the, the camera shots, the, the angles, you know, the, obviously the acting. We only had three leads in this, and two of them were not series regulars. They were recurring characters. So I really liked that. Yeah. Uh, I liked liked it too, Ryan. And (laughs) there's, you know, the other thing that I liked about it was... um, I, I like these unusual pairings, right? Because now totally. we had Garrick and O'Brien with Nog. It was like, this is a combination we haven't we hadn't seen before, right? And the the lineup was interesting to me. I'm like, okay, how are these guys going to interact together? And what are you know? We know that um, O'Brien hates Cardassians, right? He, he has like this disdain for them, right? He's almost. Yeah. racist about it he almost yeah. he no, hates he them is. so much he doesn't even call them cardassians <laughs> yeah. he calls them cardassians <laughs> he yeah. oh, the too. cardassians i'm like it's and five seasons wife? in and he's still mispronouncing it yeah and, and to his wife he calls them the cardies mm-hmm. the right right yeah and i think it's well. i think it's good that you pair them up together garrick is obviously aware of uh yeah. o'brien's disdain so he's going to keep pushing that button just like you know uh yeah you know what you want to do you know i i know i know what's deep down inside you i know how you feel about me and so i like that i also like the fact that nog was there um there were moments there that were just really classic for me with nog's character um he shows 
I mean, because it's because it's a fearful episode, right? He he looks out the window, sees the the, the, the uh, runabout blow up. I mean, like that would be the first thing. I'm like, oh, this is over. Yeah. yeah. You know, but I loved of, his performance. Yeah. Speaking of Nog, real quick, I feel like this was Nog's as a character. This was Nog's biggest leap into the spotlight. I mean, mm. he's had. He's had episodes with Jake and Nog where they were like possibly the A plot, you know, or, or a very strong B plot. But this was the this was his biggest role now that he's in Starfleet. Uh, you know, in the like when he was on the Defiant listening in, doing all this stuff, cool. But this was the first time this 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 thing, this episode was carried by three main characters, right? The three of them. And he was one of them. And I don't think that's ever happened where, where Nog was one of the three main characters of the entire episode. There really was no B plot. It was just Garrick has a few times, you know, uh, obviously O'Brien has countless times, but this was Nog's, I think Nog's biggest leap forward as a character, as as somebody that they're going to be using a lot more in the Starfleet stories, it seems. Yeah, I, I agree. It it is his first leap into the, and and I think it it also is a great um, episode to demonstrate how far he's come, and how far he still needs to go because there's so much innocence in everything that he does until it, it gets real like the scary bits get real and and then he you know when garrick goes psycho but um <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it is his first real um time as a main person driving the story along, mm. which is really cool and he knocked it out of the park i think yeah yeah, I'm going to slightly disagree a little bit and just say that I think his growth really started with when he stood up to uh, his right. dad and his uncle and said, I'm going to do this. I think to me, that was the beginning of me really saying, OK, this guy is is a, got my attention. He's like about to mm. break all cultural norms and, and do something different. Um, what I would say, though. Um, in agreement to what you're saying is for me, this is the biggest growth of him as a Starfleet person now, like exactly. after having committed himself to Starfleet, this is, this, this is like me seeing him in the kind of action where it's like, oh, okay, I get to see what he's made of. And um, the, the, the fear, the courage, I think he expressed all of that in very uh, a real way that felt authentic to me because there were moments when I felt his fear. There were moments when I felt his courage. Um, mm -hmm. I thought there was a moment, like, for example, when they first arrive at uh, Mpok Noor and uh, the chief says, hey, we're going to have to go in there and, you know, and, and go crawl into the airlock or whatever. And Nog says, I volunteer. And mm -hmm. the way he said it was like, it was courageous to me. It was like, he doesn't know what he's about to face. He doesn't know what, what he's up against, but he was willing to say, I'll go, you know, I'll put my, my life on the line to get this job done. So, um, <clears throat> and then when, when the stuff starts hitting the fan, I felt like it was authentic because it wasn't like, Oh, I, I can kick everybody's butt and I'm the best. It was, there was fear there. Like, you know, it's just like I was having fear, like what's around the corner. What are they up against? Why is it so dark? Somebody turned the lights on around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that too um and i think that that his enthusiasm as garrick puts it shows his innocence still as well mm -hmm. um he hasn't faced real danger yet in the way that he's about to face and you can see that when he's practicing his stance with the the phaser rifle yes it, that was it so fun reminds me of a little kitten you know practicing <laughs> their pounce it, it yeah. was playful but you know he was wiggling his butt before, yes. before <laughs> like a cat before the pounce 
Yes. And, and, and there's an innocence to it. And he doesn't know that that danger is literally around the corner, which is, it, it, it's a, a great, um, great character moment, I think, because he does it so well. It, it, it's so genuine, just like you said, it, it's, it's authentic and it's wonderful to watch. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a great time watching him kind of jump around, go, ha, ha, gotcha, ha. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind, of, kind of practicing, kind of panicked, kind of, but it was it yeah. was a lot of fun. That was really cool. I do wonder, you know, like in the writer's room when they're throwing these ideas around, like if they have these moments where they're like, what about Nog? What about Nog in this? You know, because you think, okay, there's an O'Brien thing and then Garrick is there. Who should be? And they kind of like, what about Nog? What do you think? Yeah, I think that, you know, like, I feel like there was like kind of a moment where they're just kind of thinking who's a good third person. And, mm -hmm. you know, they maybe they they might have thrown Rom's name out there because he's also kind of going into engineering and stuff. But they thought Nog's kind of a better way to go. And it's, you know, and I do wonder if it was just like a quick thought or a discussion or whatever, but there was that moment and we love it you know we think it's perfect you know it's it's such a an iconic episode to me because i just love the idea of like this sister station there's yeah. this other station out there somewhere that's just like deep space nine that we never heard about but it's there it's just some old junker and it's the perfect reason to go do it because they need to pick up some parts you know um i i just i really liked the idea and I liked the execution because, you know, Deep Space Nine does do, there was also that horror episode in like the second or third season with Bashir. Wasn't Bashir like imagining things or something like that? Or Bashir became the bad guy? Oh. Started doing oh. the voice, some of the guy's Vatican? voice. Vatican? Yeah, whatever. Was it that it was. One? Yeah, I don't even. Where where it some so long essence, ago essence <laughs> took over his body or something. Yeah, and, and then oh, it kind yeah. of flopped around. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so they do these things every once in a while, and they're usually used as bottle episodes. And I I was very happy with this one because it was very different than how most of the episodes go. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know what? I want to just go and highlight a few things about um, Aaron's performance in this yeah. episode. He um, really plays with lines and, and very small moments so well. And I want to talk about those little small moments. The first one that popped out to me was um, when he's in Quark's bar in the beginning of this episode. And there's that banging going on and there's clamoring. And, uh, you know, they walk in and they're like, oh, God, let's go. Let's go eat across the street. You know, yeah. uh, Warp is like, I'm out of here. This is too, I can't eat it. It's quieter over there. Uh, and then Nog comes off in the background. Now, clearly, he's he's part of the construction crew. So he, he, he's doing some work. And Cork starts busting his balls a little bit. And the relationship dynamic has changed slightly. Right. Where. Yeah. yeah. Right. You see, there's yeah. like. Now, uh, Quark talks to him a little bit differently than he normally does. He, he normally goes right to the bottom level, like, hurry up and do this and get out of my face. In this way, he was like, <laughs> like yeah. it, it, in this way, he was like, you know, you are, you're fixing something over there. And I, you know, you are part of Starfleet now. And all right. So he, there's a level of respect that changed. And there was also a level of respect that changed the other way, like, uh, Nog talked to Quark a little bit differently, right? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, because there was a moment where Quark says, uh, what do you need? And he's like, and he looks at him like two root beers, you know? Yeah, that was great, yeah. <laughs> I you love should have been like, line. what do you think? I was like, duh, <laughs> uncle. <laughs> yeah. We need root beer. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, you want to work here with, a, you know, with no hydration? Uh, so I just like, I like the... Um, the play between there and there's just subtlety and the way that Aaron puts on his performance that makes it so unique. It's like, you know, you, Ryan, you always talk about, you always envision how another actor would have said those same lines or how yeah. you would have said those same lines. 
And to me, it's like Aaron says lines in a way where it's only kind of like he'll say it that way. He, he has his own unique way of saying something. Um, and his nervous, his nervous yes. mode. Yes, I was going to say that. Is <laughs> best. Where he has, like, his, he has um, like a little nervous laugh afterwards, like, oh, just put it yeah. here. <laughs> like yeah. he, he adds yeah. that nice little nogism right there. Yes. yes, when he's uncomfortable and nervous, and he, he he's like, uh, uh, you know, like I think there was a there was a line there somewhere. Oh yeah, um, the chief was asking for a tool, and um, while right. the chief was asking, he's like, he's like, "Give me that tool! Give me that tool over there!" And oh, Nog, Nog's like, I left, I, yeah, and he's like, "I left it on the <laughs> runabout." I'll I get it, uh, uh, sir. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Chief. Uh, hey, uh, you know. Yeah. We do have to run to our it break was... real quick, um, but let's talk about that a bit more because, yeah, that there's a lot more to discuss there. Um, we'll be right back on the seventh rule. Everybody, welcome back to the seventh rule with Sorak Lofton. Hello, hello, and Melissa Longo. Hello. <laughs> I was hoping we'd get a song. I was thinking about that uh, yesterday. I was like, you know, back in the day when we'd introduce Melissa, she'd go, hello. And I was like, I don't know if she's done that lately. Let's see if she does it this time. But you did. And you, you hit it. the same note. God bless you. Um, so Q bless you. Sorry. So real quick, here are the trivioids. And then we're going to get right back to Nog Talk USA. Rom says Nog can learn a lot from Chief O'Brien. Captain Cisco bribes Garrick with a larger space to hem dresses. Asking a Frankie to play a Cardassian game is like asking a Klingon to chew with its mouth closed. Garrick really wants Chief O'Brien to play in a game of Katra. Garrick calls Chief the hero of Setlet 3 to get under his skin. And a flux coupler is not a coil spanner. Lastly, because <laughs> <laughs> there was that little mix up there, Garrick yeah, finds yeah. a Katra board in the station commander's office. Anyway. Yeah. Back to Nog and his nervous chuckle um, and the things that he adds. Can I, can I add a little, just something that I noticed in uh, Captain Sisko's office was the clock um, from Babel was sitting in front of the window when no they passed. Way. When they passed, uh, he and Chief O'Brien and Odo were, were passing the window into their, his mm. office. I was like, that's the clock. Wow. It's in his locker oh. on display. I love that attention to detail. That's so cool. I do too. So anyway, more not. Very good catch. <laughs> did not catch that at all. Yeah, it's in the very beginning, like a minute fifty-nine, I think it was. <laughs> so Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. Getting that's, used that's... to time stamping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> um yeah. But, uh, I, and I have to agree with um, you, Sirach, where you, you're, you said that only Aaron can deliver certain lines yeah. the way he does. Like when he was watching the ship explode and he says, that's not right. It, there was just something in the way he said it. It wasn't like, that's not right. It was like, that's, it. I don't know. I can't do it because he's, the only one who could do it that way um but yeah. it was perfect i was like oh my gosh so good <laughs> so good yeah and i mean his fear was palpable like there were moments <laughs> when you could feel his fear um and and even there was even when um he was in the uh, little space there with o'brien and they were fixing the conduit thing or whatever whatever and um, he says, yeah, you know, my uncle says that you can fix anything, you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and then they, they, they lay down and then the, the smoke hits them in the face. But I just felt <laughs> like, <laughs> I just feel like there's, you know, he's, he, there's so many uh, facets to his performance in this episode. He covers a lot of ground. So there's mm -hmm. him in the beginning. Um, there's no danger. He's just, that's his, you know, he's talking, he's, kind of like duh to his uncle Quark, right? Who likes to be the smartest guy in the room, but he's hitting them with the duh. And <laughs> duh. 
<laughs> right? So he, 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 so he starts cute. off with that. Um, he's trying to flatter and get close to O'Brien. So he's got the, we see the kind of like, you know, siding up to him, like trying to be, you know, I think, O'Brien said, that was smart. How did you know I needed that tool next? You know? And he was like something about like, I pay attention or something yeah. to that degree. Well, yeah. And so, I was so impressed by that too, because you yeah. can see him paying attention and his attention to detail is so great. It would a, 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 a <clears throat> brilliant, subtle character trait to throw in there. It, it's not obvious. And I don't know how, you know, it's it, it just, it was, I like that moment too. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, throw, it's, once again, I think that showed his enthusiasm because we did, um, <laughs> Garrick does highlight his enthusiasm in this episode. So I thought that that was a great display of his enthusiasm. Like, like I'm already a step ahead of you. I'm watching what you're doing. You're going to use this, this tool next. So I'm already right there. Um, but then his vulnerability, the fear and the uncertainty at certain moments when it was like, uh, what do we do now? You know, yeah. and I, I, I believed I was, you know, believing his performance. I just felt like it was great. The other thing was it was ac accentuated a lot by music. Yeah. Um, music. And you mentioned that earlier, but I, I wrote it down in my notes, too. I was like, well, the music yeah. in this episode like, so was I. blaringly good. Yeah. It was like, wow, yeah. this is good. Like. It makes you take note of it. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a, and it's, it's a necessity. Like waiting to see yeah. It's a necessity in, in an episode like this. We A lot of times we don't realize it, but it can make or break an episode. If, if the music does not match or preferably elevate the scene, then it stands out as cheesy or hokey or a scary episode that's not scary or a tense mm -hmm. scene that's not tense, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that they did match it and elevate it as it's supposed to. And, you know, we should definitely take note uh, of that because this is a show that's not known for horror. This is a uh, franchise that's not known for horror. So it could very easily not play well. It could very easily show that this is not their, their niche, you know what I mean? But they, but they did it just fine. They did it very well, and they should be commended for that, for doing something that's kind of out of their wheelhouse, but still knocking it out of the park, you know? It's important. Yeah. The music, yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh, it sets the tone so well. It, and, and I wrote down the music by, which I never do. Oh, cool. Good job. <laughs> But, yeah, but I was like, gosh, I got to see who did this because it, it was paired so well in this episode that I was like, ah, oh, yes. Nice. Well, who did? Who yeah, did so, so please let us know. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> and I'm just going to leave you guys in suspense. I'm going to make you beg. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm ready to write it down. <laughs> um, Jay Chataway. Oh, we've seen Jay that name. Jay Chataway. Yeah. Jay Chataway. So good. And I, and I liked that it was suspenseful and, and nuanced and, but, it, and it still had the, the um, Star Trek theme under, just under the surface. Mm. So it, it was, oh uh, yeah, uh, I loved the music in this too. Great. Yeah, I have to say this was like, um, it was kind of an Alfred Hitchcock meet star trek episode uh we know with the horror and suspense in there um i like the way that they isolated the crew based on looking for a part because there was moments there i was like how come there's not a doctor you know when somebody gets hurt and you're like how come there's no right, doctor on board right and i was like well because technically they were just going to haul away some junk so um you know Bashir wouldn't be there um to your point earlier about nog's presence in this episode what made it work well was the fact that, you know, when Garrick loses his mind and decides to kind of take Nog as a hostage, it gives uh, O'Brien somebody to be worried about whether they live or die, right? Totally. Because <laughs> if it was one of the other guys, he'd be like, I don't even know that guy. This is the first yeah. episode we work together. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Whatever. Well, he got transferred two it, weeks ago. What do I care? Right. 
<laughs> right. And it did right. make sense that he brought they brought Nog along because I, I kind of looked at the other four as well as Nog as the lower decks, so to speak. Yeah. So um, it would make sense that Nog would come and come along because he is part of that lower decks crew. And and I thought it was interesting that Nog was the only one of them in red and the only one to survive. <laughs> it was the opposite of the red shirt. Yeah, opposite day, even yeah. though in yes. my notes I did put I did put four red shirts come along because they're red shirts in spirit. You know, <laughs> they're red yes. shirts yeah. in spirit, even it's though they're wearing all gold. wearing gold, except for Nog, who's the because only one who survived. Remember, the whole red shirt thing happened during the original series when the colors were switched, when yeah. the people that wore red were engineering and security and operations. And now that's gold. So actually, they were all technically red shirts just with the switch color. But <laughs> speaking of <laughs> writing decisions, you know, the decision to have a doctor or not have a doctor. I noticed a writing decision that had to have been deliberate. Um, you noticed they mentioned at least twice that the people that came along on the mission were volunteering. Mm -hmm. They mentioned that two or three times that they were volunteering, volunteering, volunteering. They kept saying that. And I think the reason for that is because they all died. And as a writer, they're probably thinking, we don't want to make our captain or whoever's making the decision look bad to send them off on just a junk salvaging mission where they all where half the people or more than half the people die now if they volunteer for it then that absolves some of that kind of responsibility and so i think that was probably a discussion that was had in the writers room where they're saying look we can't have him send them to their death for some something so minor or just something in hindsight where that we kind of go oh boy that's kind of a, a black mark on the record there this way if they volunteer and they made, made sure to mention it two or three times so i think that was a really smart decision because that absolves any sort of you know looking back in hindsight and going was that a good decision was that a good decision now we know that in, in subsequent episodes they actually embrace more of that dark side. They embrace more of Cisco, you know, killing people or sending people to their death. Um, but that is a deliberate thing rather than, you know, these kind of things where it's like not, not too hefty of an episode in the grand scheme of things. So I thought that was just an interesting. Yeah. Angle. There's really no way for uh, Star Trek to get around having expendable people because <laughs> yeah, like, you know, they, if Spock dies, they have this burial ceremony, everybody's crying, and they shoot him in this casket, the flags that have staff, and everything is, you know, 20 minutes of the movie is about that, right? Because it's one guy lost his life, and this is the guy we all love. But the Bolian guy in the background. Hey, and, whoa, <laughs> easy, easy. We like Bolians around. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> we, we, I mean, it's like, it, it was like as soon as they were introduced, you knew, you knew that one or more of them were going to die. It was like, that was almost a given. Um, and to Melissa's point about Lower Decks, I also had that same theory. I was like, well, yeah. this is like, this is like Lower Decks episode one. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the final episode right there. <laughs> they all the died. First, <laughs> first and last episode of Lower Decks right there for Deep Space Nine. <laughs> yeah, but no. Strzok, I wanted to ask you about that a little bit where, I don't know. It doesn't seem like you were too terribly surprised when one or all of the non-essential characters died. You know, I don't think when I first watched this, I expected them all to die, but I did. You do kind of figure, okay, there's a lot of expendable characters. They never introduce, you know, these expendable characters unless they're going to die. There's going to be some kind of, you know, terrible plot twist there. But I did want to ask you, because I picture this a lot of times when I'm watching these episodes, how you reacted when Garrick turned around and killed whoever it was, Pachetti, I think, because that was the, the big surprise. Who was it? It was Amaro. Amaro, right. Um, that was the big twist. That's the thing we're not <laughs> expecting is for Garrick to turn around and be like, oh, by the way, you're dead too, punk. <laughs> yeah, um, that was a big twist for me. Um, but there was a small tell just before that 
that kind of lessened the impact for me. Mm-hmm. And the tell was when the hibernating uh, Cardassian was about to make a kill. He did some kind of thing with his nostrils as if he was smelling something. Oh, and, right. And, and, and so I was like, oh, so there's like, I was like, what if there's some gas or something in the air that's he's smelling or his senses are heightened in a way that he's smelling something. I was like, there's something here. Like the fact that he's like smelling this guy about to kill him. So that's not the face uh, I make when I smell gas. <laughs> but so that was that was one little thing that gave it away for me but it was a very good twist because then i i was like oh this is not what i was expecting um so yeah it was a very good twist um i also like the idea that they had that kind of a chess game in this episode yeah. and he was trying to get him to play the chess game and then they actually end up playing a real life chess game. Yes. Right. So yep. I'm like, oh, I love that. I love that kind of, you know, small little foreshadowing with the, yeah, you these know, connections. The, the they did that. There was another so, piece of foreshadowing too. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, no, no, no. Go ahead. There was another piece of foreshadowing that I wanted to bring up along those lines. And it was towards the beginning um, when Garrick says, I think they're just going on to the runabout. Mm-hmm. which by the way i'm always surprised i'm like how big are these runabouts i'm always surprised that like they have quarters and decks and <laughs> yeah. all these things but yeah I'm used, to, I'm used to shuttlecraft but i guess a runabout right. is very basically a runabout is in between a shuttlecraft and the defiant you know it can, right. it can house people and people can nap on it and stuff but <laughs> garrick garrick says lately everyone is starting to trust me it's quite unnerving next thing you know people are going to start inviting me over for dinner and O'Brien says, well, if it makes you feel any better, I will never have you over. And Garrett goes, I appreciate that. Now, that's yeah. funny. That's cute. But there was foreshadowing there. It's basically, yeah. you know, Garrick saying, it's weird that everybody has been starting to trust me lately. So in other words, saying, all right, guys, let's still okay. let's let's not, you know, go hug and kiss <laughs> Garrett just yet. Yes. Um. I wrote that down in my notes too. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a well, well said too. That's an, uh, Andrew Robinson is another person who has a very unique way of saying things. Totally. Um, whereas it's, it's almost impossible to duplicate. He has that, you know, it's, it's slightly charming. It's slightly dismissive. It, it's, it's, it has this air of so many different things when he says things. So I, I just love the way he, he portrays Garrick, but, um, <clears throat> But yes, that was another moment in which, you know, the writers are telling us um, this is the direction we're about to go in, right? Yes. And, and you be, brace yourself for it. Um, but even after that, even with that, I still was kind of taken back by the fact that uh, Garrick turned and then started killing people, right? And I also think it's... Um, it's kind of strange because at the end he was like, "Yeah, tell what's his name, his wife that you know my bad." <laughs> what's his name? <laughs> tell what's his name, my bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah tell what's his name's wife. wife, my bad. You know, it's like, oh, really? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I get it. There's a, he was infected with the psychotropic drug that only infects Cardassians, and and you don't know how that's gonna go you know change his physiology physiology yeah. and neuro pathway or whatever but uh so and i get it and there would be guilt there and i think that it's a nice contrast to show that garrick isn't innately a psychopathic killer that he does have you know other emotions beyond you know i i just hate everyone and and i'm a big curmudgeon but yeah, I want to like just edit a tiny little clip of Melissa saying, I hate everyone and I'm a giant curmudgeon. And that's it. Like no context. <laughs> post that, people will be like, what has gotten into you, Melissa? <laughs> and we're, and we're uh, <laughs> uh, there was another line that I liked um, Garrick when when 
one of the lower deckers was saying, you know, he was talking about the third battalion, first division or whatever mm -hmm. that group of right. uh, Cardassian soldiers were in. And he was like, their motto is three words, death to all, you know. And Garrett comes in three words, but it says, you know, the, the way he, <laughs> yeah. he's like, he's admiring he's like the it. Guy, <laughs> he's admiring <laughs> it <right? laughs> and it's just like, uh, he, he's like the, the guy to narrate something. He's the guy that you're like, you're like, I got I want to listen to him talk because he's so good at just making things sound appetizing, you know. Here I am, like looking at death to all and hearing it, like, yeah, it does sound, it does have a uh, simplicity to it or something. Those you know? three little words that everybody wants to hear. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, speaking of the end there, there was something at the end that was also very funny and clever. You know, like even in, in an episode like this, there's humor. Um, yeah. When Garrick says, you know, if I was any closer, that phaser would have killed me. And Chief O'Brien says, well, don't take this the wrong way, but that was the plan. <laughs> and then Gary just says, yeah. I understand. She says, see you around. <laughs> and that's it. No handshake. Yeah. No, sorry, buddy. No, whatever. Yeah. She's like, I understand. You were trying to kill me. And she's like, yeah, yeah. Chief, there, there's no my bad from Chief. He's just like, yeah, yeah, I, I was. See you. Survival. <laughs> you know. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and there were and the other one there was like a moment too where chief had a corny line but i liked it uh when he you know the you know um garrick says let me see your gun and he says do you have another one and he pulls up the other one and he says ah how clever and da 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 and then they go through that whole fight scene and then chief detonates the thing that he had yeah. you know the weapon oh. that he brought and he says something like i'm an engineer and it was yeah, yeah I, I know. I'm not a soldier. I'm yeah. an engineer. Yeah, that is yeah. such a that's such like an <laughs> '80s or '90s line, but that's what this is. This was '90s, but yeah, it, it was yeah, a little cheesy, 90s. but I kind of I kind of liked it a little bit because it's like I I beat you with science. Yeah. You. <laughs> she blinded me with science. <laughs> exactly. So. I kind of like that little, and that was the check. That was the chess of them, right? That was the check. The yes, back and forth that chess that they were yes. playing, right? Yeah. Like yeah. I made, I made you disarm yourself. I got, you know, I got one up on you, and he's like, "Well, I got one up on you," and then back and forth. So that chess <laughs> checkers kind of matchup was um, pretty fun to watch. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And not to go back to Nog, but <laughs> do it, do it. <laughs> and when, when he's playing the Katra <laughs> against Garrick, and the look he on his face—he thinks he's playing Tonga. Is... He thinks he's playing Tonga. <laughs> 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 and, and he's like, I'm, Tongo. I'm... Sorry, it's Tongo, <laughs> but, right? Not Tonga. I always get those mixed up. Tonga. Sorry. Please continue. Ta Tongo. Tongo. Or, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, but, but the look on his face, though. You yes, were saying. because he was so intent and focused in the game in protecting his assets. Yes. <laughs> dealing yes. and dealing. It was, yeah, so great. And, and see two different species, two different cultures playing a game against each other with two very different strategies of a approaching that game so mm. cool <laughs> all right uh we got to go to our free-for-all in just a second here but speaking of protecting our assets we want to give a very special thank you to carmen aka skillet tj jackson bay out in missouri bill victor arukin uh, yvette blackman tom <laughs> homer freezy out somewhere in new easy eve england out in wales dr Anne marie siegel titus moeller tim <laughs> Baum. Dr. Susan B. Gruner, John Mann, Mark Rocco, Darlena Marie, and Rex Foray Wood. Wood. We'll see you on the other side. We're going to hit the free for all right now. And always remember the seventh rule. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule. This is the free for all. We are joined today by Homer Freezy out somewhere in New Yeezy. We've got Eng Eve England out in Wales. It's Rock Lofton, you know well. Melissa Longo, you know well. We have Dr. Susan B. Gruner. 
Rex A. Wood is driving between Philadelphia and Delaware right now. Just get probably somewhere in Kentucky. Uh, and Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel. <laughs> Here we go. This is the classroom edition. So everybody be good. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say, uh, when I say your name, please say present. <laughs> yes, here. 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 <laughs> oh, that's great. That's how we used to do it in school. Roll call. Present. Here. I just wish somebody could be up on that screen in the in the corner up there you see oh, wait fun. you see that wait hey, that could be screen? where the episode is yeah but i can't i try to put so look she can't oh wait there we go <laughs> whoa there we are whoa all right we should have that playing in the background yeah so everybody that's listening in and doesn't know what the hell we're going on about that's what british people say they say what are you going on about um no what are you on about I can't keep up. Uh, but, so we're just screwing around with with what the the picture looks like. It looks like we're in a classroom. But anyway, let's talk about this episode a little bit more. Homer Freezy out somewhere in New Yeezy. We know you've got some interesting observations to toss our way. Yeah, uh, this was a lot of fun. And in parts, it was very, very scary. Uh, the music certainly contributed to that and uh, i don't know where i went i'm over there um and then you always know it's either a crime scene investigation or it's a horror film when people start flashing flashlights in your eyeballs true yeah <laughs> and they did a great job um, or you would have never doctor. known oh right which can be scary but not as or you're scary being pulled as over <laughs> okay perhaps you'll tell us about that later uh, yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm glad you highlighted the music homer it definitely was a mm -hmm. good accent on this episode it, it drove emotions yeah uh and i looked to see the the director and i'm i'm blanking on his name but at first i thought it might be kim friedman but it was michael behar i did i did think you know, that too he also um directed the other the first brian fuller episode that we had so this right. is the second right light in He's the dark prolific. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Here we are. Oh my gosh, after school. We're back. <laughs> Detention. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, out forever. Eve England, you always have some goodies from the uh, Deep Space Nine companion. Do you have any today for us? Oh, and by the way, by the way, check out Eve England's awesome mug that she's got just for Halloween. Look at that. <laughs> That, so prepared. You can get that at Abyssinian Kiosk. That is Sirox Sisters' website. It's really cool. Also, the shirt she's wearing is from Abyssinian Kiosk. There it is. Gorgeous. The yeah. shirt that Homer Freezy is wearing is from Abyssinian Kiosk as Ooh, well. I love that one. That one is really cool. Mm -hmm. Someone else so cool. had that yeah. too. Was it you, Sue? Yeah. I don't think so. I thought I saw I've got that one in pink and blue. I have. Rock has one like it. Uh, walking art made by Melissa yeah, bracelets everywhere as well. So check those out. All those in the description box below. Actually, Sorak, I noticed you're wearing a good friend of ours as well. Oh yeah, uh, you see what yeah. it is. Rocking that afro knot. Mm -hmm. So one check of my all that shirts. out. That's in the description box below. Uh, Anne Marie, are you? It looks like you're uh, probably wearing. Cool for any eyes. Sweatshirt and yeah. slouchy. Very nice. That is nice. at our Teespring website. You can find all this stuff in the description box below. With a discount. With a discount. Discounts is two. Uh, Eve England, please continue. Yeah. Oh, is, um, Sorry, Melissa's also. I see it. I see the very top of a head from Melissa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mock episode. <laughs> There yeah, we go. that's also walking art made by Melissa. Eve England, I swear to God, that's the last time I'm going to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's a couple of, obviously the companion is always full of little gems. Um, so it, it's interesting that, you know, this is what counted as one of those scary episodes. They deliberately wanted to transform the station into a haunted house. That was a deliberate thing that they did, obviously, to set the scene. And one of the main things they did with that, which I don't think I would have noticed had I not known that before so they the, the one the main thing that they did was replace the geometric 
carpet in the promenade with a what they called a um boring gray carpet because they also really? wanted it to look a bit like ice oh, so they, they changed, yeah so they changed the whole carpet um mm. with that sort of gray to make it look a bit icy as well so I thought that was really clever and I, when 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 I knew that it was quite obvious then but I don't think I would have spotted it generally so that was really cool um and the second point which was really interesting and I think which really does add to it so you know the bit where um Garrick is stalking the two officers um and, and they're sort of talking about um their partners being killed and they were talking they even mentioned the spoonheads um so right. what they were saying that originally it was it wasn't that wasn't scripted dialogue it was just supposed to just be dialogue that you weren't supposed to hear it was just sort of filler dialogue that they created and then they were they yeah they were surprised then that you could actually hear it so they had to get extra approval but it didn't go through the same channel so they said that had that been in the original script it probably wouldn't have made it through the vetting because of you know you've you're not used to seeing starfleet officers using racial slurs but they said that actually it really added to the intensity of the of the scene when you know showing that they really had had a bad day and that they were really struggling with this wow. whole situation so it sort of added that context so I thought that was really interesting that you know that's I think it's, mm-hmm. they said it's the first time you hear a Starfleet officer using that that term um, but that it was it was by accident really it wasn't intended you weren't intending to hear that at all um when they first uh, shot it so um but I thought that was mm-hmm. a really that was a really good way of of really adding that intensity to the whole scene so how like familiar were these um, officer actors to right. be able to like add yeah, that. that? Yeah. Well, no, no, it was um, done on an ADR loop, so yeah. it was done post. It was yeah, done so. in post. So yeah, so, so they they, they took it to yeah. Ira oh, okay, or, okay. or Rick Berman. So and then when they saw it, they were like, uh, I don't know if this is a good idea because it's a Starfleet officer saying a racial slur. So, but then they let it go because, um, and I read up about this last night. So, uh, <laughs> but then they let it go because it, it uh, spoke to the truth of the drama that was happening and the trauma that was wow. going on um, in the situation. So that's why they let it slide. And what's really, because what, what that really made me think about is how many more pieces of dialogue do the writers write for those scenes that are never intended to be heard by anyone that mm-hmm. might get lost along the way that you know and that, and that so that you know that's an example of a piece of dialogue that they never intended to be on the screen but which was really great dialogue um so I, mm-hmm. yeah I thought that was just really, it was a really interesting story and I'm, I'm, I'm glad they kept that in because I think it did add add a lot to it I felt like that I I heard stuff like that about three or four times in this episode too. They kept doing that in this episode. Like there was when they were walking onto the runabout as well. And a couple of the main characters were like talking, you know, maybe it was, it was Garrick and O'Brien or something like that, but we could hear them kind of shuffling around in the background and they had their own little conversations and it did feel very unscripted in a way so i was wondering about that and i it feels like that wasn't the only scene that they added you know adr to but maybe it was but that you know i felt like that was kind of a running theme that i noticed in that episode that's really interesting kind of like a dark lower decks episode (laughs) it definitely had low decks vibes didn't it Yeah. yeah well um sue have you seen this episode recently yeah, about 20 minutes ago, I finished it. <laughs> Doesn't what get timing? more recent than that. Yeah, what timing? <laughs> uh, did you remember it well from when you had seen it before, or were the twists no. still big twists for you? No. The notes that I took, what did I do with them? Oh, <laughs> right in front of me. <laughs> um, I wrote uh, that I loved the use of the light, or lack thereof, it made it very dark, like he was talking about. I really loved those outside outside shots of the station. They were yeah they were tilted a little. I, love that. I don't remember them doing that before. Yeah, and I'm wondering also why didn't they send the life forms before they went on the station? They what? Nitpick. What on the stations? They didn't scan for life forms. Why wouldn't they do that? Oh. Yeah, I've been wondering if like if you're in a stasis too, if they for some reason couldn't pick it up. You don't know. Hmm. 
But if I was yeah, I thought about that too. They assumed bulls were going to be there, but right, (laughs) that's true. I would definitely. Anne Marie, on a scale of one, on a scale of one to ten, what did you give this one, Anne Marie? Obviously a ten. (laughs) 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 So good, but I also really love the addition of. I mean, obviously, there's so many amazing parts in pieces uh but i really love the use of the psychotropic drugs and looking at at the use of that in soldiers um and i think they they experimented um with that a lot like at least in world war ii and when you're watching european and british television it comes up a lot in like episodes where they're talking about previous wars and like um or people finding it in attics of like grandparents who had passed away left over from world war ii so it's interesting it doesn't come up on american television as much but Obviously, it makes, I mean, if you're taking a bunch of stimulants so that you can stay awake and keep guard of things, it makes you like a lot more aggressive. And I thought it was a really cool addition to this episode. Mm. And it's Mm. not really fair to the soldiers either, obviously, which I wish they, I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't wish they had delved into that part of like, that's not really fair to these like Cardassian soldiers that they took over their lives and did that to them. Mm. I don't know if they volunteered for it, but it kind of adds to the Cardassian culture that that's acceptable. Right. Right. I wonder if that was a nod to things that have happened in the past in our own history where, because I mean, we certainly have a history of testing things out on people, on soldiers, soldiers and civilians and kind of just, yeah. just trying to be like, well, how do we make our soldiers better at what we want them to do? You know, they, they signed yeah. a, they signed a contract, right? They signed a waiver. It was actually on Call the Midwife this week, the episode that came out like in America, even. Um, what? Where, are there new stimulants? Uh, yeah, it just started this week. Not with new stimulants, like not with stimulants, but in terms of like soldiers um, exposed to radiation and not telling them. Like Ouch. all these kind of things are real and like hiding the records and that's not what they signed up for. And then they don't know. And so I saw a lot of similarities to that with whatever happened to these Cardassian soldiers. And obviously it's no surprise to Garrick and he's able to make the leap of what's going on with them pretty fast. Hey, where did Rex go? Super interesting. <laughs> he dropped out at <laughs> <of> school. <laughs> 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 right. He he knows. Knows. Maybe I should yeah. put it back on the school view. We we left. He transferred. Let's see. <laughs> we, Rex, we're we're doing. He transferred classes. He didn't like where, the professor. Where, Rex, are you... <laughs> he, he got sent to the principal's office. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or he was check has to go are to you, the bathroom. Are you down here? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's over here somewhere. <laughs> Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because um, you mentioned the psychotropic thing, Anne Marie, and I was just it just brought my mind back to the word that I just kind of did a little research on recently, and it was berserk. And yeah. when people say to, to go berserk, is actually referring to a group of people known as the berserkers, who were these warriors that would fight. Uh, in this kind of a wild trans like rage. And it's been, you know, thought about whether they were either in a trance from meditation or if they were actually taking mind altering substances that would make them kind of fight in that kind of a way. But um, I think that there is some some truth to how, you know, governments experiment with different uh, either truth telling things or uh, try to make advanced soldiers that are able to fight forever or fight more violently. So this is definitely something that's realistic for me um, watching this episode. Definitely was a horror episode. So it was kind of right on time for the month of October. Ah, awesome. I like the fact that, that, you know. Well, we did. We were actually thinking Deep Space Nine for having the foresight to do they, this 24 years they ago for us. Yeah. yeah, they are so good. They are so good. They knew we were going to do this. And did the classroom people know designing that they would do Starfleet co- colors? <laughs> yeah. I was that. Good knowledge. Good knowledge. <laughs> so here's hey, a fun. Oh, there was something. Uh, re- oh, really quick. Yeah, no, I just please. wanted to mention this. 
There was a word that came up twice in this episode that I just thought was hilarious. The first time it came up, Odo said it. The second time, the Bolian said it. And the word is booby trap. Mm-hmm. Okay. Odo, Odo said something like, yeah, the place is booby trapped. And I laughed out loud. I couldn't. I thought Star it was Trek hilarious. Loved that term. That, there are even episodes called it. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Bolian says something. I was like, Bolian booby traps. I actually wrote that down. But um, huh. um is there no other way to describe it but booby trap? Like, is booby trap like the only way? There's no thesaurus on that. All right, here we go. Let's or, find out. Or, or you could say it the way the Goonies say it, and it's called booty, booty trap. trap. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, <laughs> I want to know the etiology of booby trap. Yeah, didn't, uh, didn't people yeah. used to be called boobies if they fall for something? Yeah, where did this terminology come from, Homer? I think it was a type of bird. <laughs> yeah, that's a not very a bright type of bird. bird. A blue-footed booby? Blue-footed booby? <laughs> um, that could be. <laughs> yeah, there really isn't uh, a different word for booby trap unless you're talking about the, the specific trap itself, in which case they say like landmine or mouse trap or setup or trip wire or like pitfall. Trip. Right. So there's no real synonym there. Not that I can find or can think of, no. Apparently, the word burpee yeah, that's has been used since the late 17th century to mean fool or idiot. Actually, now that Sue that you had mentioned the blue-footed booby, I kind of remember from like a science class that maybe it, like a lot of birds have tricks for each other. I kind of remember there was maybe like uh. a trick with booby um, like nests to trick other birds about eggs and nests or something mm-hmm. well have to look it up from the origin and meaning grammar monster site it says in the late 17th century hungry sailors would set a trap for seabirds known as boobies the term booby trap was literally a trap mm-hmm. for a booby however it has evolved to mean a harmful device designed to be triggered by its unsuspecting victim interesting yeah, Wikipedia Sailors. says something similar, but apparently there's an old English word, which is booby, which just means a stupid person or slow bird. Um, and they said that it was originally a term used for schoolboy pranks, but became a booby trap as we know it now, based on sinister events and things it says in World War One. apparently. So, yeah. so that's when it had its connotations from a military perspective. But yeah, I don't think there's another word that you can use in the writer's room in Star Trek, like, love that word. It's yeah. in TNG all the time. Hey, Rex, mm. I just want to say you haven't missed much. We've been talking about boobies for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Uh, that was the uh, 8008. We've been Googling uh, booby. <laughs> you were putting it on your calculator. <laughs> and we were passing it around in the classroom. <laughs> I pulled off the road, though. Oh, nice. I'm at the gas station. I'm so, at the shell station. We have a few minutes left. Rex, do you remember this episode? Have you seen it recently? Do you remember the MPOC yeah. War episode? Oh, cool. Any thoughts? Yeah, on absolutely. It? Well, I mean, you know, I'm sure it's been mentioned, but at the beginning of it, where Garrick is like, everybody's beginning to trust me now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and it's like, okay, you gain the trust. And then at the end of the episode, with the psychogenic gas, he now goes nuts and he's trying to kill everybody. So it's like, I just gained this confidence of everybody, and now I just blew it because of the psychogenic gas that came out. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually one of my one of my top probably 20 episodes I like. Nice. Really, it was kind of exciting, a lot going on through it. Um, and then, of course, just the beginning where, you know, that they're working on the couple and, you know, Sounded of like a jet a lot quieter back then, you know? So nice. absolutely. But yeah, a good episode. Really good episode. Cool, cool. You know what we forgot to play? Jake Cisco guesses the IMDb score. <laughs> oh, whoa, I forgot that. Um, Rex just reminded us. Yeah, I like this episode. I, I'm hoping it was an 8.2. 8.2? 8. 8. That's too low. Yeah, I think it's higher than that. I, I think it is too. You think it's higher? 
Mm. I mean, right. it should be. It should I be. cheated. <laughs> yeah, Melissa cheated. Too. Everybody, looked. everybody who cheated, you could tell because they're going like. Yeah. Uh, no yeah. comment. <laughs> it's a seven point nine, which was very wow. close. Oh, uh, oh, oh. We need to go on IMDb more right. and rate these. Yeah, we need to be rate that. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that needs a higher. That got, it's got to go over eight. I feel it's like go it's, over eight. it's yeah. worth a ten at yeah. least for that like amazing moment of Garrick at the end where he ten at least. Don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like, it's just like that amazing moment where um, Garrick at the end happen. like asks um, O'Brien to talk to that guy's family, and that's yeah, just, like such a beautiful moment to see that like Garrick really does have a heart. Well, as yeah. Sirach put it, he said, "Yeah, tell what's his name's wife, my bad." Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but still, oh, he's so compassionate. <laughs> <laughs> <Sirach>. <laughs> That's just, that's what I felt at the end. I was like, my bad or whatever. Yeah, tell her, tell her my bad. Send her a <laughs> yeah. fruit basket with my name. Oh yeah, yeah dear, cool. Fruit basket. Oh, fruit basket. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. for fruit baskets for people. <laughs> I never saw that game that he was playing either. <gasps> so, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I love how Star Trek makes up games. I want it to be like shoots and ladders or or risk or something. <laughs> oh, risk. <laughs> Shoot the ladders? Did you think? Oh, is it about protecting your assets? What was it? A, a business game? Oh, I thought it was about no. like a battle. Yeah. It was a it war was a game, battle. but Nog was playing it. Was a it was a battle. Like, for, yeah. Yes. It says it, okay. It actually it's a says battle it, ship. It says it's yeah. uh, envisioned to be a cross between chess and st- Stratego. I don't know. Oh, if fun. That's, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. This, oh, this is like, Stratego this one? No, that's Stratagem. Oh, that's Stratagem. Yeah. Okay. I like sketch of it in the book. Cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. I want to I play. Want, I envision lots of pieces. <laughs> we got to play these games. We got to like I get them Star licensed by Star Trek and create these games. And then That's do the way tournaments. To <laughs> yeah. Cool. I play Sanction solitaire tournaments. tournaments. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually. It's you can lonely. play like double and triple, and then we have boards at my house for like years of who's winning every game. Speaking it's of board, um, awesome. all right. So I guess <laughs> this, that's it. We do have to run. You guys escaped. I had a, a fun question planned, but I guess you know, is that psychotropic drug or gas? What does your shirt say, Ryan? Because I've been looking at it this whole time. Oh, and it's I'm just me like too. a. It's making me feel like I had a psychotropic. Is it a drug. bandana? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just like a bunch thing. of. It's just a bunch Deadpool? of bodies. Yeah. Is it Deadpool? No. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty. Yeah. Oh, it says yeah. dead on it, right? Yeah, oh, Deadpool. Like to match that Deadpool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, but so the question was that this psychotropic drug brings out the worst in people. So I was going to say, mm-hmm. if you were on Empok Nor and this thing affected humans and it brought out the worst in you. What would that trait be? But you guys have been saved by the bell today. <laughs> so you, you know, because you guys are like thinking like, do I want to, I don't know if I want to divulge that. <laughs> I, I'd be eating too much junk food. That would be yeah. the worst for me. They'd, so Rock, you ate all the ice cream. <laughs> Girl, same. You know the jump sticks. It's this drug I'm on. <laughs> I'm gonna say, right. did you grow up in my house because <laughs> that was all the cheddar the cheddar <laughs> oh, the cheetos where's the cheetos <laughs> I want those. sharp cheddar oh my god so, what is this show getting sponsored by cheetos we'll save this maybe for next week so you guys we can you guys uh you've got your homework ahead of you so hey, you know you know what a thought would be just to leave everybody with um is to think about what would be a lineup if you were to do Star Trek Halloween Horror Week. What episodes uh, yeah. would you? Oh, yeah. Can that be our roundtable? Yeah. yeah. Can that be the October roundtable? Yeah, that's a good one. That's Sp- a good October. idea. October. So, something to think about. Because <laughs> this episode made me feel like it was Absolutely. definitely would be in the commercial for the, you know, Fright Fest Halloween Star Trek. You know, and <laughs> the other really fun episodes. fact about this episode is that Ryan has hard drives and one of them is called, um, is it, isn't it called Deep Space Nine? And then you have another one and it's called Empok Noir. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, way back in the day. you put dorky stickers quick, on your hard drive? The first, no. The first thing, <laughs> um, 
the, the first thing way back in the day when we had those thumb drives, remember everybody used to have thumb drives. I got an orange thumb drive, my first one, and I called it Nog. And I, on, you know, I said, I, ne- I always forgot to tell Aaron that, oh, oh, but dorky. this was like 15 years ago. And I, and you know, cause it could fit on, I could write N O G, you know, right on that little orange thumb drive. And this was many years before I even met him. Then I got a big, you know, external hard drive and I called it deep space nine. Actually, it's right here. Deep space nine. I guess it's not that big, but Mine's orange. big storage. Oh, that's cool. And then, that's so true. I recently got a lot. another one and I'm like, well, how do you follow up deep space nine? And so that one is obviously called Mpoc Nor. <laughs> And pop nor. That's the evil you one. Can't see it. It's plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we do have to run. Um, but thank you all very much for joining us. Homer, Sue, Melissa, of course, hooray. Uh, Eve England, Rex A. Wood, Anne Marie Siegel for Aaron Eisenberg and Sirach Lofton. Uh, we do want to thank you for joining us. And always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>